Hi, I'm Sarah Middle. I'm a postdoctoral researcher on the Tools of Knowledge project at National Museum Scotland. Um, and I'm also presenting on behalf of my co-authors, Alex Butterworth from the University of Sussex and Rebecca Higgett, who's also at National Museum Scotland. Um, I'm going to start by giving an introduction to the Tools of Knowledge project, our database and how we modelled it, and then introduce concepts of object biographies and itineraries. I'll then present three case studies in object itineraries um, before talking about our conclusions and future work in the area. So the full name of the project is Tools of Knowledge, Modelling the Creative Communities of the Scientific Instrument Trade in Britain, 1550 to 1914. Um, it's funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, originally um, between January 2021 and June of this year, um, but we've recently been extended up until the end of December this year. It's a collaboration between the Universities of Cambridge and Sussex and National Museums Scotland. And we're also working with partner institutions, Royal Museums Greenwich and the Science Museum. At the foundation of our project is a database developed by Gloria Clifton at Royal Museums Greenwich called Scientific Instrument Makers Observations and Notes, or SIMON for short. It started with Gloria filling out information about scientific instrument makers by hand on printed index cards, which she later input into a Microsoft Access database, which formed the basis of the printed publication Directory of British Scientific Instrument Makers, 1550 to 1851. Um, Gloria has further expanded the Access database to include information about makers up to 1914, with some careers extending beyond this date. And the database now includes over 11,000 makers with about 40 different types of relationship. So the current Simon database is extremely rich, but it's also not openly available. Um, to access it, you need to go to Greenwich in person, and it can be difficult to use without Gloria's expert assistance. Also, as we discovered only gradually, a vast amount of really interesting and useful data appears in unstructured free text fields called helpful things like MISC info. And so it's not readily discoverable, even if you know how to query the database. And this includes information about awards, exhibitions, business and royal appointments, and dozens of other categories. So a large part of the Tools of Knowledge project has involved remodeling Simon using an event-based linked open data model to produce a new interactive and eventually openly available data, data set, Semantic Simon, or SEMSIM, which will be hosted by Royal Museums Greenwich. As well as increasing accessibility and discoverability, SEMSIM will reveal relationships between the people described in the data and make connections to the objects they created. More on this later. To create our data model, we've developed a bespoke events-based ontology the Scientific Instrument Makers and Events Ontology, or Simeon for short. While its inspiration and some key foundational classes and properties are derived from CDOC CRM, we soon found that CDOC, which has a cultural heritage focus, does not provide the level of nuance that we require to describe the diverse life and work events described in our database. Um, these complex events include apprenticeship, which is shown as an example on the slide, as well as employment, flourishing, selling, patenting, and legal processes. Through this event-based model, we aim to surface the social and cultural worlds of the makers in the database, including family and business relationships, guild memberships, and mobilities. Using the event as the core of our data model has meant a departure from the way that these relationships are represented in the original Simon database, so for an example, an apprenticeship would have been represented as had apprentice and or an apprentice to relationship with additional information about that apprenticeship, such as dates provided in the MISC info fields. Placing the apprenticeship event at the center of the model has allowed us to bring all this information together to connect the relevant people, guilds and dates and provides further scope for linking to other entities in our data set. To complement our event-based model, we've also geocoded the 21,000 addresses in the database to city, town, village, or in some cases, street level, to enable geographic visualization, as well as applying confidence assessments that range from flagging a piece of information as uncertain or adding a qualifying note to applying a probabilistic judgment. In addition to remodeling the Simon database, we're in the process of integrating complementary data sets, including several that provide information about the instruments that these makers created, the users and interactions they experienced, their journeys through time and space, and their current situations or ultimate destinations, i.e. their object itineraries. 
Some of these began as text corpora, from which we have used natural language processing methods to derive references to specific scientific instruments or instrument types, and then relating these back to makers in our database. And we've also begun to look further back to the trade in raw materials from which these instruments were made, which has added a more global perspective and highlights the role of the scientific instrument trade in colonial exploitation. However, here I'm going to focus on the new kinds of stories and insights produced by linking to museum records and collections data from tools of knowledge, collaborating and partner institutions. So these cultural heritage objects are not static or inert. Instead, each one represents a journey through space and time to reach its current position. This journey consists of a sequence of events, including creation, use, alteration, movement and acquisition, and may ultimately lead to decay or destruction. Each of these events occurs in a given place, at a given time, and often involves the actions of a person or organisation. As such, these sequences are often referred to as object biographies, a term introduced by Kopitoff in a social anthropology context, and since adopted in archaeology and museum studies. The term object itinerary has a similar meaning, but it implies a more continuous sequence without the fixed events of birth and death. So an itinerary might look back to the formation of the materials from which the object was constructed, or look forward to its future receptions or remediations. Following the proposition by Dunn et al that such itineraries may be represented as linked open data, we have applied these principles as part of our work on the Tools of Knowledge project. So in the following slides, I'm going to present three case studies of how we might go about modelling the itineraries of individual scientific instruments and assemblages thereof. So while the instruments involved are of different types, their usage in astronomy, navigation and surveying should be considered in the context of their role in facilitating global exploration for the purposes of imperial expansion and colonisation. Our first case study is on a clock, or more specifically an astronomical regulator, which was made by John Shelton in 1756 and is a well-documented instrument held at National Museum Scotland. Astronomical regulators are a particularly accurate type of pendulum clock used in astronomical observations and for calibrating marine chronometers, which were used in navigation. Looking at the metadata about this particular clock, we can immediately see various ways in which connections might be made with other entities. So, for example, we might readily link it to other objects made in London, other clocks, other astronomical regulators, or objects made from similar materials. And of course, we can link it to information about its maker, John Shelton. So in this slide, we have the structured information about the astronomical regulator from the museum catalogue, connecting it up to the data that we hold in SEMSIM, linked using the simian ontology. And this allows us to contextualise the object within the life events of the individual who created it. But once it was created and sold, the astronomical regulator set off on its own adventures, carving out its own itinerary. Um, the following sections of the catalogue record provide some clues about the adventures that this clock has experienced, both before and after its acquisition by NMS. We might use this information as a starting point for more detailed data modelling to represent different stages of the clock's itinerary. So, for example, its ownership by the Royal Society, or key events it took part in and the places and people involved. And we can also supplement the catalogue record with information from the key 1969 publication by House and Hutchinson, The Saga of the Shelton Clocks which brings together timelines for this clock, as well as four other astronomical regulators produced by Shelson at the same time. Using the information provided in the NMS catalogue and the House and Hutchinson article, we've produced a simplified timeline of some key events in the Shelton clock's itinerary. This timeline shows various events in which the Shelton clock was used, notably including Cook's first voyage, which is ostensibly to observe the 1769 transit of Venus from Tahiti, but which ultimately opened the door for the colonisation of Australia by performing the first detailed survey of the region. Towards the end of the timeline, I have included the clock's acquisition by National Museum Scotland, signifying its transition from a working scientific instrument to an exhibited object. And on either side of the timeline, we can anticipate how the clock's itinerary might be modelled further into the past if we trace the origins of the materials used to produce it, as well as how its travels through space and time might continue in future. Using this timeline and the Simeon ontology, we can model various events in the Shelton Clock's itinerary, one of which is shown in the diagram. This particular event is the voyage of the Chanticleer, which surveyed multiple locations in the Pacific Ocean, including many British colonies, and it took place between 1828 and 1831. 
The Shelton's clocks, Shelton clock's use in this expedition is documented in an inscription that appears on its hour disk. While this expedition is interesting in itself, it also highlights the relationship between the Shelton clock and another type of timepiece, one which was crucial to navigation by allowing the accurate calculation of longitude. And this is a chronometer French 4214, which forms part of the assemblage of instruments on which we focus our case study too. So chronometers are highly accurate timekeepers that were used to calculate longitude on board ship by comparing local time with Greenwich time and thereby obtaining a precise location. And as such, they accompanied most naval expeditions from the early 19th until the later 20th century. The Admiralty, which was the government department responsible for command of the Royal Navy at the time, has kept detailed records of the working lives of these chronometers in a series of ledgers. The, Admiral chronometry, the Admiralty chronometer ledgers, which comprise 28 volumes, are now held by Royal Museums Greenwich, and they're a rich source of information on the itineraries of approximately 10,000 chronometers used between 1821 and 1936. They document individual instruments and record their maker, serial number, date of purchase, and each occasion on which they were issued by or returned to the Royal Observatory at Greenwich. These records tell us the ships and dockyards that they traveled to and from, how often they were sent for repair, as well as information about their eventual fate. Some were lost at sea, while others were transferred to new owners, including museums. By transcribing information from these ledgers, we can expand our understanding of the use of these instruments and relationships between instrument makers, suppliers, and users. So picking up from where we left off on the first case study, we saw the example of chronometer French 4214, which joined the Shelton clock on the Chanticleer expedition. Using its en entries in the Admiralty chronometer ledgers and the Tools of Knowledge project database, we can use a timeline visualization to represent the chronometer's movements on expeditions, including accompanying Charles Darwin on one of the Beagle voyages, while it returned regularly to its maker and the Royal Observatory before it was lost on the Erebus expedition. But as I mentioned before, there were lots of these chronometers in circulation during the 19th and 20th centuries, as well as a rich source of handwritten information about them. So how might we collect data about their itineraries and represent it at scale? The Admiralty chronometer lectures have already been scanned and basic details recorded in a database. Through our Zooniverse project, Voyages in Time, we are asking volunteers to transcribe them so that we can transform them into structured data that can be modelled similarly to the object itineraries given in our previous examples, but to a larger scale. Using this data, we'll be able to track patterns of use, test and repair. And for some at least, we can cross-reference the locations and movements of the ships or individuals that they were issued to and map their travels throughout the world and their return journeys to particular hubs formed by makers and observatories. In our Zooniverse project, there are three workflows, chronometer information, basic information about the chronometers, and then transfers to and transfers from um, different ships, expeditions, or captains. Each one has a separate form that the user can fill out with the information in the document, and they're guided through this process by tutorials, a field guide, and frequently asked questions. We're currently in the process of applying for official Zooniverse approval, but the project is live now if anyone fancies having a go at transcribing. And continuing with the Admiralty theme, I'm now going to move on to talk about our third case study and assemblage including instruments of different types. Um, so the assemblage in case study three is a set of 101 navigational and surveying instruments acquired by National Museum Scotland in 1911, some of which are pictured on the slide. They were donated by the Hydrographic Office, which was then part of the Admiralty, and were previously working instruments, but by this point were no longer being loaned out on expeditions. The Hydrographic Office was, and indeed is, responsible for collecting information about and providing charts of areas that include major bodies of water, such as oceans, seas, lakes, and rivers. And the instruments in this assemblage include theodolites for measuring angles in land surveying, sextants for measuring angles in celestial navigation, as well as compasses, rain gauges, deep sea thermometers, telescopes, and various drawing and measuring instruments. And to identify some of the key entities and relationships in the metadata about the Admiralty acquisition, we used Recogito. And if you attended the Pelagios session yesterday, you will know that Recogito is a free online platform which is developed as part of the Pelagios network. And it enables named entity recognition and annotation of text and images, although obviously we've used text in our example. Um, so in this example, we've applied named entity recognition to the text. And so we've automatically identified places in green, people and organizations in blue, and events and dates in purple. 
Um, we've also manually annotated other types of entity that aren't automatically picked up by the system and applied our own set of tags. These are shown in pale yellow, and particularly we've used this feature for things like objects, where we've tagged them using the rel relevant scientific apparatus type from an ontology that we're currently developing. And then finally, you can add and define relationships between the different entities in the document, and these are shown as dotted arrows. Um, and these annotations can then be exported in various formats, including CSV, TEI XML, and RDF. Um, place is particularly well integrated within Recogito, so when you, when you annotate a place, it will automatically try and match it up to a gazetteer um, for a place with the same name. Um, so this does um, require some manual checking and correction with places that have the same name, but once you're happy that your places are linked up correctly, Recogito will provide a ge geographic visualization to show them on a map. So here are all the places mentioned in the data about the Admiralty 1911 instruments and which were possible to link to gazetteers in Recogito. And I should say that while most of the places are included, there were some that were not possible to match up um, to places in the gazetteers currently in Recogito. Um, and this is often the case when working with historical place data. Um, often additional specialist gazetteers are required. Um, we've also used the Recogito annotation data to manually construct itineraries for some selected objects from the assemblage, which demonstrates the links between them. So in the example here, we can see two objects used on the British Antarctic expedition on the discovery between 1901 and 1904. As well as being connected through their relationship to this event on their itinerary, which itself would have incorporated numerous instances of individual usage, we've also included the events of their production, illustrating that both objects were made in London. In fact, multiple objects from the assemblage were used on this same expedition, with many others accompanying previous polar expeditions being exhibited at major events and winning awards. And their metadata additionally incorporates highly detailed descriptions of their parts and inscriptions, all of which might be further modeled using this approach, building up a larger scale map or graph of itineraries and relationships. So to conclude, um, while the scientific instruments presented in these case studies depended on human actors for their creation, maintenance and use, these people were in turn shaped by these objects. Our work therefore re reveals the codependence of the human and technological, demonstrating the value brought by combining data about scientific instrument makers from our project database with data about the instruments they created. This consciously, conscientiously curated data, modelled with an unusual level of detail and nuance, can allow us to resituate cultu cultural heritage objects in relation to alternative narratives. Artisans as makers, repairers, apprentices or peace workers are less often the focus of public histories of science, and their achievements have historically been downplayed or even obscured by museums in favour of a narrative that emphasises major milestones in scientific development. I've also mentioned the role of the instruments um, <clears throat> included in these case studies in the acquisition, maintenance and exploitation of colonies. Detailed digital models of these objects' itineraries instead provide a multiplicity of perspectives on the creation of scientific knowledge and the events that led to their later acquisition by collections. The Tools of Knowledge Project database, complemented by its links to collections data, offers a rare example of a data set that brings together prosopographical, <laughs> spatial and material structures of analysis and understanding. And together, these afford the necessary ingredients for an especially rich form of historical storytelling. However, at the moment, we've only been able to construct these rich itineraries manually and are keen to explore the scalability of this approach over our remaining time on the project while being sensitive um, to their particular historical contexts. In particular, we're eager to see the results of our crowdsourced transcription project described in case study two, in the hope that these can be used as a basis for automatically constructing chronometer itineraries at scale. Thank you. Thank you.